السلام عليكم. اسعد الله صباحكم على مشاركتكم في الحلقه المباشره حول مشهد الرقم من دولتكم. محدثكم خالد الدرويش مدرب مدير اداره مؤسسات مجلس الاعلى للاتصالات في جامعه الرجاء من ابو الهوادف او الرحى الصامت بالنسبه لاخواننا الصحفيين. توجد ترجمة فورية والآن سأواصل بالغلب. Good morning, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the release of Qatar ICT Landscape. My name is Khalid Al-Dirwish, Enterprise Development Manager, ICT Qatar. It's wonderful to see many leaders, members of the press, in the room who clearly recognize the importance of ICT across our sectors. This report explains the state of ICT Qatar in terms of ICT adoptions across the different sectors. <coughs> it provides valuable information for decision makers as Qatar moves forward in achieving its national vision of diverse, flexible economy. Today, you will hear from ICT Qatar Executive Director of Market Development, of Market Development, Charles Watt, uh, who will share with you the key finding of, of, of the report, also shed some light of their importance. He is joined by Tara Kohler, the Market Development Project Manager, who was involved in the development of this report from the early beginning. We are also honored to have with us Dr. Muhammad Adulta, the Professor of Business and Technology in, at uh, NC. Dr. Sumatra is also co-author of the Global Information and Technology Report, which addresses the network readiness of nations around the world. Other continue to raise and the World Banking and Dr. Sumatra will draw a parallel between the, the International Report and Qatar ICT Landscape Report. After we hear from the expert, we will take a question from the audience, so please follow the question. And now I would like to welcome Charles Watt to the podium, so please to share with us the key finding of Qatar ICT Landscape. Thank you and uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to present to you Qatar's first national ICT landscape report. In this presentation I will uh, step through uh, a brief introduction which summarizes the report's aims and broad outcomes. The methodology applied using primary and secondary research, some of the top level findings and we will then go into a little more depth uh, by sector. Finally, some key messages moving forward. Qatar's ICT Landscape 2009 is the first countrywide survey based ICT study looking at the state of ICT adoption in Qatar. The report indicates how sectors crucial to the growth of a knowledge based economy, including residents, government, Businesses, education, health, and tourism are progressing in adopting ICT. The report also looks at the ICT job market. Now, it also provides a clear picture of the state of ICT in Qatar, and it gives a good understanding where Qatar is compared to developing and the developed countries in terms of adoption by all sectors in society. As a short definition, ICT adoption is defined as the integration of computers, internet and related technologies and social and economic activities. If I had to summarize in two messages, what would they be? The report will demonstrate that Qatar's people, institutions and government have made steady progress in adopting ICT into daily life. And ICT Qatar is working to accelerate ICT adoption across all sectors to realize 
the nation's vision of a diverse economy. Now, some detail on the research methodology that was applied. ICT Qatar commissioned Dubai-based MADAR research to survey and analyze the state of ICT in Qatar. Qatar's ICT landscape 2009 is based on 13 field surveys that produced a total of more than 4,000 interviews over a period of five months. To supplement this, extensive secondary research involving surveys, face-to-face -face and phone interviews, and self-administered questionnaires were incorporated into the report. Some of the challenges in both collecting and collating the data were as follows. Qatar, along with Kuwait and the UAE, has a high transient labour population. The study presented two values for some indicators. One uses the total population figure and the other excludes the transient labour element. The majority of the transient population are largely unskilled, non-internet users. Hence, ICT, ICT adoption figures based on the entire population tend to be less favourable. Now, Qatar has a high percentage of businesses in the micro-enterprise category, which tend to have a lower ICT adoption, greatly impacting findings in the business sector. So the, the overall picture, let's have a, a look at that. Qatar ranks among the top three nations in the Arab world in terms of combined performance in basic ICT indicators. That's the number of computers and internet users, mobile and fixed telephone line subscribers, broadband internet subscriptions. And Qatar is being recognized internationally for its progress rising to 29th among 134 nations in the Network Readiness Index with the Global Information Technology Report issued by the World Economic Forum and INSEAD. Uh, as you can see, last year Qatar ranked 32nd out of 127 nations. An assessment of the main factors that support ICT adoption, availability and quality of ICT infrastructure and services, and ICT skilled users shows the lack of ICT skills is Qatar's biggest barrier to adoption. It's difficult to compare like with like, but the study also shows that Qatar's government, businesses and residents are not on the same level of ICT adoption. Overall, residents outperform government and business sectors in ICT adoption, with the business sector having the most progress to make. So let's look now into some of the more detailed sectors by looking at the results in each one of these. First of all, you can see from the graph on residents that the overall residents in Qatar have been steadily increasing their ICT adoption rates, especially, especially in terms of basic use of ICT tools, that's computers or the internet. Among the residents' population, excluding transient labour, Qatar's basic ICT indicators are comparable to European averages, with 63% of internet penetration, 54% computer users, and 121% mobile subscribers. And Qatar also performs extremely well in basic internet use, the use of email and search engines. However, Qatar's performance in using advanced ICT lags behind European counterparts, particularly in usage of advanced services <coughs> such as e-banking, e-government and other applications. And the cost of some key ICT services such as broadband internet use remains too high and is highlighted as a factor. Now to businesses, uh, Qatar's business community has accelerated ICT adoption to assume a leading position among developing countries, with PC penetration at 100% for large organisations and 98% for SMEs, and 90% of all businesses are connected to the internet. Micro-enterprises, that's below 10 employees, do lag behind, however, in ICT adoption measures. And overall, businesses in Qatar 
have the greatest room for improvement in ICT adoption, with one quarter of all enterprises using advanced internet services such as e-commerce and e-banking and e-government, compared to two-thirds in the EU15. The, the, the ratio of businesses using computers is 67%. That's 30 points less than e, the EU15 average. And broadband access is also relatively low at 38%, uh, lower than the EU15 average of 52, 82%. Now, as far as government is concerned, in many areas, government is leading by example in terms of ICT adoption, including ICT training for staff and the ratio of PCs to employees, with 80, over 88% of PCs uh, per 100 employees. And government also uh, outperforms the business sector on all indicators, from the number of ICT training hours provided for employees and ranks 22nd in the GITR and readiness in the 25 in, in usage. Uh, another key point here is that a significant number of government services have yet to be transformed into e-services to encourage widespread use of e-government in Qatar. One area that does need further analysis is that the percentage of ICT, of IT staff in the government sector is low compared to the world average. And let me now turn to the education sector. Qatar schools have an average of 12.7 PCs per 100 students, the highest in the Arab world. Of all the types of school in Qatar, independent schools have the best ratio of computers to students, 16.2 PCs per 100 students, which is significantly higher than even the EU15 average of 12.1. More than half of all students in Qatar have the skills that qualify them as digitally literate. Qatar is unlike European countries where ICT adoption levels rise as grade levels also rise. So intermediate schools registered a high PC to student ratio higher than the secondary schools. But Qatar lags behind European averages and the percentage of schools with PCs in the classroom. In health, one of the findings was that the government-run health sector in Qatar is better equip equipped to provide ICT tools and infrastructure than privately run facilities. You can see, for example, that 95% of physicians and 78% of nurses have internet connection and internet access. 70% of health professionals in Qatar have also access to the internet at work, and nearly 76% of physicians are connected to an online professional network. The availability of advanced health-related internet services is, however, limited, with 15.6% of health providers having a website, and only 3.1% offer transactional services. Now to, to tourism. The number of visitors to Qatar each year is rapidly rising, creating an opportunity for the tourism sector to benefit from ICT adoption. The, the majority of visitors to Qatar are ICT literate, business professionals who require easy and reliable internet access. 95% of visitors use the internet during the stay in Qatar, and 90% of hotels offer internet access to guests. And one challenge or opportunity is that a minority of visitors used Qatar-based websites to look for travel and recreation information in Qatar. The ICT workforce, um, the demand for ICT professionals outweighs local supply with the gap expected to increase. Qatar is expected to continue attracting ICT workers due to the country's rise as a regional business hub. And finally, one of the key, message is, key messages is that recent graduates from local universities will face increasing competition with an increased influx of expatriate ICT professionals. So, moving forward,
Qatar has begun to lay a strong foundation for sustainable economic and social development, through much, though much work remains. The country must accelerate its efforts in order to realize the nation's vision of a flexible, diversified economy that benefits all who live and work in Qatar. ICT Qatar's three-year master plan provides clear strategies and programs to increase ICT adoption across all sectors. Continued liberalization of the telecoms market, improved ICT infrastructure, increased broadband penetration, and the nurturing of local ICT talent are key focus areas. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, ICT Qatar will be sharing the report findings with all key sectors to encourage collaboration and deliver results. Thank you. progress that the country has made over the last several years. In my presentation, I will not only build on the earlier presentation, but I'm also positioned now in the global context. And the global context really is provided by the research which we have been conducting in collaboration with the World Economic Forum to produce what is today titled the Global Information Technology Report. So we have been producing this report for the last nine years, and today it is fair to say that this report has become a global benchmark. A global benchmark in assessing how well do various countries benefit from technology benefits from the network economy that is being created around us. So you see that uh, with the benefit of some experience, we are able to make some very strong statements based on hard data, which was not possible previously. You know, when we started the study back in the late 90s, there were a number of stories, anecdotes, about this village in this country using technology, this city in this country using technology, and there were anecdotes. There wasn't really a very systematic basis to understand how technology was impacting competitiveness, how technology was impacting GDP growth. And what we did really was we came up with a systematic approach on the basis of which you can today conduct analysis. Now I have shown out here one graph on the x-axis, which is the horizontal axis. You have the score, the index score that I will talk a little bit more about, which measures how effective is the country in using technology, the Network Readiness Index, NRO. On the vertical axis, you have the GDP of the country. And what you see out here is a fairly linear relationship between increasing NRI and increasing GDP. You get a similar relationship if you plot the network readiness index of countries and the competitiveness of various economies. So what we have is, for the first time today, we have data on the basis of which you can make some statements which previously were probably harder to make. And that, in fact, is the value of the kind of work which we have been doing. 
Now, this simple graphic gives you an image which shows you the underlying factors that we consider when we look at how technology impacts society. It is not just a question of PC penetration or mobile penetration. Technology is pervasive. As you have seen previous, in the previous presentation, technology permeates all the sectors. You know, yesterday I was with Dr. Hesser at the World Economic Forum Summit in the Dead Sea in Jordan. And I was moderating a panel in which we're discussing technology leaps for the Middle East. And one of the points made out there was technology is a great accelerator for change across society. And technology is a great transformation tool for communities across societies. So what you see is the impact of technology is very diffused and in our framework we try to capture it by recognizing that there are three major actors. Individual citizens, you know, each one of us, governments, very important players, increasingly important all over the world, and of course businesses. So these three players we try to evaluate how ready, how capable are they to use technology. We try to also evaluate how much are they actually using technology. So that's where the readiness and the usage dimension comes in. And of course all of this happens in the overall context of the economy. The political environment, the regulatory environment, the financial environment, all these things matter. Now you might ask, you know, what is relevance of the environment? Why do you give so much importance to it if you're talking about technology? Now I'll give you a very simple example. Even though I'm from India, I live today in France. And France, despite, you know, despite the fact that it's a very rich country, has access to the best technology, is not amongst the top performers on our index. And you ask the question why? It's not because of lack of access to technology. One of the things which is holding back France is very rigid regulations, in particular in the human resource side. Now we know, for example, that when you implement technology in companies, often you have to make changes in the human resource side. Maybe reskilling, maybe, you know, reassignment to other jobs, in some cases even downsizing because technology sometimes replaces human effort. Now, what you see is to make those changes in France is extremely complicated, extremely difficult. And so as a result, what happens is companies either don't implement the right technologies or if they implement technologies, they don't get the benefits which they should get because they are unable to make associated labor changes. It's a very small example, but it's a very illustrative example in terms of why the environment is very critical when you look at technology and how societies and economies use technology. Now, this is just different representation of the same model. Nothing really new information out here, except that the environment pillar is broken down into three sub-indexes. Now, if you look at the report in more detail, we go and outline measures for each one of these indexes, but for the purposes of our discussion, it's important to identify the three players, individuals, businesses, governments, and the overall environment in which these three players operate. Now, another example of the kind of analysis which you can conduct. And we have done many such analyses. And this is the second and last graph I'll show you. So here, on the x-axis, what you have is a score of how ready are the three actors, individuals, businesses, and governments. An aggregate score for the readiness of the three actors. On the vertical axis, you have an aggregate score for the usage, how much do people use the technology. 
Now it's interesting to see this interesting result that it is not a straight line. You see some kind of an upward, sort of slow exponential curve out here, which shows that if you're really at very low levels of readiness, if you just increase penetration, just increase access, that may not necessarily give you proportionally the same increase in usage. To get really high increases in usage, what you start seeing is an economy needs to complement that access with a whole range of additional features. To give a simple example, you know, we heard about internet access in schools. You can provide access to schools. But what do you do if A, there is no content, especially local content? What do you do if the curriculum is not redesigned? What do you do if the teachers are not prepared? Now these kind of elements become very important to in fact drive the usage up. So what you start seeing is, if you pick countries, and of course you can't tell countries in those dots, but if you go and analyze countries and you ask the question, okay, why is this country doing better than another country even though the usage readiness indexes might be quite similar, you start actually understanding the differences. And often the differences come in the context in which technology is being used. Now, just a very quick sample of the kind of variables that we use in our study. I've already emphasized that we use a holistic measure of the economy's ability to use technology. It is not just a question of simple pure IT measures. These are some examples and of course it gives you a flavor of the kind of measures that we're using in our study. We use a number of different measures, 30 variables for environment, 23 for readiness and 15 for the usage. So some examples out here. Now if you look at the results for this year, and here I have just on the left hand side of the screen, and I'm not completely sure you can read the text from behind the room, you have a very simple ranking of the top 20, top 20 countries. And if I looked at the top 20 countries in the world, you see some general trends. So you see, for example, that Scandinavian countries historically tend to do very well. You see that America is probably the only large country that does in fact typically very well in the top five usually. Then you have some new emerging countries, countries like Korea, countries like Singapore, countries like Estonia, that have moved up quite dramatically. So as I told you, we have nine years of history. So over nine years of history, you can actually see how countries move. So some countries have moved up quite significantly. And then there are other countries that, for different reasons, have in fact, you know, stayed at positions which you might think are lower compared to what you might believe based on the economic or the historical abilities. I mentioned France and Germany. You see out here France is at rank 19 and Germany, which is the world's biggest exporter, is at rank 20. So just keep these ranks in mind because it's important that when you look at the rank for Qatar, you have to be able to compare it to the ranks of some of the major players. So if you look at the top players in each region, and here we're just taking the top three in each region, in the Middle East you have the three top players. The, the first position is Israel at rank 25, the second is the UAE at rank 27, and the third is Qatar at rank 29. Now, these are very good results. Very good results because 
if you compare it the result, the results for France and Germany, it is very, very predictable. In fact, the results for Qatar are higher than the results for many European countries, including Spain, Italy, and others. Now, if you compare it to what is widely recognized as a technology powerhouse in the region, Israel, even compared to Israel, what you see is the performance of the UAE and Qatar is extremely strong. The difference in ranks is only two. And if you go and look at the actual scores, the difference of scores is very, very small. So 4.98 on a scale of seven for Israel. UAE has a score of 4.76 on the same scale of seven. And Qatar has a score of 4.68. Small differences and very, very close to position. So the overall message out here really is that if you look at the global positioning of Qatar today, it is extremely good. Can it be better? Yes. Will it be better? I certainly hope so. But nothing, nothing to be shy about or embarrassed about. If you compare to the global big players in the space, you're doing extremely well. I think this is something which should be a matter of pride for the country. <clears throat> now, because we have data for so many countries, we are also able to compare regions. And we are able to compare regions and look at how different regions have moved over the last several years. So in this case, from 2001 to 2009. Now, it's very difficult for us to compare precise ranks. As you probably know, the number of countries changes every year. The first year we did the survey, we had 75 countries covered. This year, the last year, we have 130 countries covered. Because the ranks are relative ranks, you cannot easily compare directly the scopes. But what you can see is, if you actually compare based on decile categories, so you take sort of decile groups, groups of 10, and you ask which category, which category of groups of 10 you are positioned this year, and how does your position vary year to year, that's you know, about as accurate a measure of progress over time you can get with this kind of uh, ranking. The important and very surprising finding for us initially was that the Middle East, which second last line at the bottom, is the region that has made the highest progress over the last eight years. So it jumped up by 3.5 decile groups. And this is very important because this is what we also observe that it's not just in Qatar or the UAE, but in general across the Middle East there is increased emphasis on technology an increased recognition that technology is important for the development of the region. And development not just to develop the next PC company or the next software company, development in a very horizontal, broad, holistic manner. For education, for health, for finance, for a number of different key critical sectors, technology is a very important driver. And you see the realization coming in in these results. Now, over the years, we have conducted a number of case studies. So, the two streams of work we do. So, one stream of work is looking at numerical data. And the second stream of work is looking at case studies. So, we go into countries and we try to understand in a little bit more depth, beyond the numbers, what is driving the success of these countries. So, if you look at two or three very quick snapshots of case studies. Singapore is a very popular case study. And Singapore is a country that has moved very rapidly up the rankings. What you start seeing is a few things stand out. The first thing, of course, is the government's role. It's quite remarkable the leadership shown by the government in forming strategic ICT plans, the various phases of plans of the last 15 years that they have actually gone through very easily. Second is, if you think about among the various actions, what stands out, 
there's a very strong investment in education. Singapore did not really have any top universities 20-25 years ago. Today it can claim to have at least two or three top universities inside its small boundaries. So you have not just the foreign ones like INSEA, which is a campus out there, you have a homegrown strong institutions like the National University of Singapore, like Singapore Management University, like Nanyang Technological Institute. So you have a number of homegrown institutions which has been a priority for the government, they've invested in it. And in fact, in Qatar, some of that is happening also, so it's a very good long-term strategic move. Singapore started it 20 years ago. What is also interesting is Singapore has a very open immigration policy, probably one of the most favorable immigration policies for skilled talent. I don't know whether you know this, but a skilled immigrant to Singapore can get a work permit in seven days or less, okay? which is quite remarkable if you compare it to any other country today, or at least most of the countries today. So they make it very easy for people to come in. They provide an environment which makes people feel at home. Singapore is probably the only country in Asia which really is truly multicultural. Even if you go to Japan, it's very Japanese. You know? uh, Chinese cities are very Chinese, and it's very Indian. Singapore is truly multicultural. It's a number of interesting things, and of course they have a very clean, you know, less corruption in the government than most of the countries and very strong focus on efficiency. Another case study, just to give some glimpses in terms of changes that we have seen. Finland, today everyone thinks of Finland as a technology powerhouse. But we forget that just uh, 20 years ago, Finland was a country selling and exporting rubber and forest products. Technology was not on the horizon, it was not a technology superstar. This transformation has taken place in 20 years and of course driven by a crisis. The crisis in their case was the fall of the Soviet Union and that basically gave a tremendous negative shock to the economy. And what happened in the case of Finland was strategically at the highest levels of the government it was decided that Finland has to reorient its economy from natural resources to knowledge-based products. So it's an excellent example of how with determined cooperation, strategic foresight, a country changed its complete orientation in 20 years from natural resources to high-tech, to knowledge economy. Of course, to, to help it make it happen, it had some good building blocks. It had the building blocks of a good government, of good governance, good education, stable macroeconomic environment by and large, and not to forget access to the European market. Finland was one of the first Scandinavian countries to welcome and in fact embrace the European market. They had access to a larger market and that was very important for the growth of Finland. Now, if you look at one more last case study from that region, Estonia. Why it's so interesting is because Estonia used technology Strategically, if you go back to the history of Estonia, Estonia used to be a part of the Soviet Union. A life which many generations, in fact, did not want to see for the future. Because in the Soviet Union, information was controlled, information was available. So what they decided was, we have to be able to give people access to information. Why? Because that is the best way to assure that we will not have a repeat of the Soviet Union. In fact, that's the reason why in Estonia, the right to access the internet is a fundamental right in the constitution for its citizens. Think about it. The right to access the internet is a fundamental right for all citizens. And it's not because technology is fun or technology is, you know, there for young kids is because technology is a source of preserving the country's future. So there was a very strong strategic vision behind why it was important. And of course, you know, behind that, after that, once you get that part correct, there's a whole set of similar things like what Singapore did and Finland did in 
terms of government leadership, <coughs> public-private partnership, and help Estonia to succeed. So, a number of sort of interesting lessons from, uh, let's say, from these case studies. On your chairs, you know, you have a small document which we prepared last year, which includes a case study on Qatar. And I think it's very interesting sometimes, you know, when you have a document, it's good to be able to reflect on the past and to be able to, you know, just summarize and learn from history. Even though it's a short history, it's got some very interesting lessons in terms of ICT and the recent progresses in Qatar. I think what you see out here is you benefited from a very clear vision. And I think the clear vision was outlined very clearly by His Highness. And I think if you read the words out here, you know, to some degree you can say, okay, these are words, you know, said by people like His Highness, you know, they have to say these good things. But really, I think it's very important that it positions technology, once again, as an active contributor to the quality of society, the quality of lives, and the social economic development. So once again, what is very important is how you position technology in your country. And I think that's something that I think is always very important. Second thing, what you see is, for the last several years, I think ICT Qatar and Qatar as a country has led a comprehensive program of change. I'm not claiming that the change is finished or the change is perfect, but what you see is the comprehensive nature of the efforts out here. And I think there has been a very strong effort at building capability. So, Again, just a small slide I took from one document that we had access to, and this more detail of this is the document case study in your, on your chair. But you see that from the left hand side, which is the Qatar vision, which I outlined earlier, to the various sectors, the government, education, health, financial, tourism, and so on, it was a very comprehensive approach of integrating and embedding technology into different parts of society. And that's one reason why I feel that the results have been stronger. If you had had an approach of just saying, okay, we will just increase mobile access and just increase internet access and wait and, you know, and, and, and sit back and wait for things to happen, probably some of the results would not have happened so quickly and maybe never at all. So I think what is important is to understand this comprehensive nature of development and I think I would strongly recommend that we make that a priority for the future as we go forward. We also heard about the leadership of the government and that is very important especially in a country like Qatar where the government is so important. You know, the role of the government is increasing pretty much everywhere but in this country especially more the government is so important. So I think the government has to play a very strong leadership role and that has been happening already to far large degree, so very pleased about it. As I mentioned earlier, there has been a strong embedding of technology in local context and we find that a very positive aspect of what has been happening in this country. And also what I like is there has been a focus on security, which is important because linked to local values and culture there are concerns, valid concerns about security, about access to different information sites and so on. And I think the focus on security, and the partnership with Carnegie Mellon, formation of QCERN and other bodies like this, has been extremely important and valuable for progressing technology in Qatar. Now, I will not go through, you know, there's a lot of information which uh, we have as a result of this study. I'll give you a website where you can actually go and look at all the information. But you can slice and dice the data in different ways. And I will just very quickly sort of scan through or run through a few slides with the message that please do come to the website that I'll give you and if you want to go into more depth. But now that we have all this data, we can actually go and see where are the best <coughs> variables, indicators on which Qatar does extremely well. So you have some of these indicators listed out here. You can ask the question, over the last five years, <coughs> last, sorry, the last three years, where are the indicators where Qatar has made the biggest jumps 
So the delta rank column on the right is the jump in the relative rank in those indicators. So once again, you see that in relative terms, the Qatar has made important moves along some of these dimensions. Now, what you can also do is <coughs> you can go deeper into one of the pillars. I identified earlier those various sub-pillars, and you can ask the question, where does Qatar have a relative competitive advantage? What I mean by that is on which variables is the relative rank of Qatar higher than its absolute rank? The absolute rank is 29, and where do you score higher than 29? So what we've done is we have just outlined with yellow the variables on which you score higher, and we have put out there three years of data. So visually, even though you can't read the various uh, lines, visually you get a sense of how the yellows have progressed for the three years, and you can get a sense in terms of which dimensions, how you're doing. So this is the market environment, the overall context in which you're operating. So here you see that you know, the progress has been quite positive. Then if you look at the political and regulatory environment, you see that once again the progress has happened, but probably not as much as you may have liked it to happen, but still you have pretty good scores out there in many of the dimensions. Now you can of course go and look at specific examples and say, well, how can we improve that? So if you look at, for example, on this uh, second, uh, the third last uh, element, the third last element is the quality of competition in the ISP sector, and you're ranked 116 out of 134 countries. Now that is a message that basically tells you that, well, hey, you know, maybe we should try and do something on that. And I know that you are making change in that area, but that gives you some effort and direction for improvements. Look at infrastructure. I think this is an area where you could probably improve. And if I look at the overall message out here, the part where you're probably needing more improvement is the soft infrastructure is the people infrastructure. And I think that's an area where your efforts in education city and all will eventually pay off. So I think the right steps are being made, but fundamentally this is an area where the soft infrastructure of the country needs to get further improvement. Now, on the individual readiness, and this was also highlighted in the results earlier, you're doing quite well. So you see a number of yellows out there, and along a number of dimensions of individual readiness, I think the state of Qatar is doing quite well. Comparatively on the business readiness, it's not as strong. And this was again sort of aligned with the results of the survey that was presented to you earlier. I think what you find is the business readiness could be potentially better. So here you see some angles of improvement. If you look at government readiness, the government readiness, which is the first bit on the top, is quite strong. And as we will see in government usage, the government usage also comes out very strong. So on the individual usage, you could have some improvement in some areas. So keep in mind, we distinguish between how ready, how capable are people to use technology and how much are they actually using technology, which is the usage. And the last elements really are the business usage and government usage. And this is again quite striking, because what you see is on business usage, you don't have a relative competitive advantage on any of the aspects of business usage. So this is a message for the business community that this is something which perhaps needs to be improved. The scores are not necessarily very bad, keep in mind, because these are scores on 134. We're talking about relative competitive advantages out here. In contrast, in the government user side, you see a number of yellows out there. So if you look at the government, readiness and usage, you see a lot of yellows and a lot of good progress out there which has been made and I think which is very important for this country. So what are the conclusions in terms of my overall remarks? So the network readiness index has become today a global benchmarking tool. It is a very holistic measure. It is not just a measure only focus on technology. And I think that's what makes it so powerful. But at the same time, because we try and cover 134 countries, 
be unable to customize in that framework to individual differences. So my recommendation always to countries, including Qatar, is you have to use that model and customize it for your own context. Customize it and create your own benchmarking tool based on the principles that you can apply inside your organizations. I think Qatar's progress over the last few years has been tremendous. In four years, you have progressed in ranks from 40 to 29. And that is despite the number of countries increasing in the same span. So I think what is impressive is the progress. My own expectation is that you will keep on progressing, of course, provided you keep on making continuous progress in the overall business climate, overall economic, political, regulatory climate. Very important. You cannot stop making progress in that because other countries are making progress in that. You go to Singapore, they're constantly asking the question, how can we make life simple? How can we keep things simple for businesses? That's a preoccupation of the government out there. If you look at the soft infrastructure, the people, you have to invest in universities and schools. I think that's a very important thing. You're doing some of it already. Keep investing in that. And of course, you need to be able to invest more in research and R&D. So that ambition to lead in research and R&D also is very important for the country. So I think I'd like to thank you for your attention. As I mentioned earlier, we have put all this data at that website. And in fact, uh, the website has a lot of complex tools at your disposal. You can compare Qatar to UAE, you can compare Qatar to the USA, to any other country you choose to compare. Look at various variables, look at various areas of strengths, weaknesses, and do a number of things you can play around with. So once again, thank you for inviting me, for making these comments. I think you should be proud of what you've achieved, and I wish you the best of luck with your future efforts. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Shmash. <coughs> My name is Wayne Ema, but I was asking for that, and I will take a pleasure of just moderating this session for you. Uh, number one, we have a number of here, members here from the press, and I can see also we have a lot of IT people, so I'm going to be fair and I'm going to open it for everybody, so it's not only for the press. But please, before you ask your question, can you just state your name and the organization you're working for? Yeah, I'm SNC from my city of Atlanta. Um, thank you for the proposed presentation. Um, just a question on the NRI. Yes, I know most of the countries use, use it for uh, to find out the countries ranking in ICT. Um, I'd like to ask how much flexibility every country has in defining some of these uh, 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 indicators like um, uh, Qatar, uh, Mr. Charles mentioned that it uh, has a very unique population with majority of, of uh, workers. So, uh, definition of workers, for example, uh, you, you have blue color, you have uh, also white color. Uh, definition of SMEs, what's a small company? And Qatar, uh, I assume, is different than a small company in the uh, US. So, how does, uh, uh, how do you see this? Uh, I mean? So, it's, a, it's an excellent question. You know, each time you try to conduct a study across 130 countries, you come across all kinds of challenges in data comparability and data aggregation. So, uh, we are always very humble when we look at data for these countries when we recognize that the data doesn't capture all the complexities of the country. Now, having said this, we have to find the way to handle it. So, the way we try to handle it is partially by as much as possible going to data from the international agencies, whether it's ITU or World Bank or other kinds of global agencies, who have some inbuilt method of comparability built into the collection procedures. So the way they collect data you know, is comparable, not perfect, but comparable across countries. So we rely on that. And second is we have a method of collecting data through the World Economic Forum's partners through a common question which is administered to a common, structurally common group of companies. 
Now, we don't distinguish between micro, small, medium enterprise in our study. If we had the data, we could have, but we don't have the data. So that's the reason why what you're doing in this study, for example, is very important. And you need that kind of study to complement these kind of results. Because these kind of results are always going to be incomplete. Okay. Then uh, a day, I said, uh, 
no time, a year, doesn't stop, doesn't hang. So uh, this is a, a, a big achievement for the uh, uh, enjoying, and we are enjoying it in, in Qatar. But uh, my question is, uh, in your report or study, what is the uh, percentage of wealth? I mean, if we mention countries like Burma or Fiji or Swaziland or small countries with uh, almost uh, millions or millions of population is almost the same, where is the, uh, the, the role of wealth in achieving this uh, progress? Because the message uh, which could be understood wrongly, I would say, or I expect, that, oh, uh, unless Qatar is a rich country, this achievement uh, wouldn't have been done or achieved. So what's wrong with it? It, it, it's, a, it's a very good question. And, uh, I think it's fair to say that you do need some level of resources to invest. I'm uh, not denying that resources makes it easier for you to invest. But it's very important to understand that having the resources doesn't necessarily mean you will be effective using technology or in creating a knowledge economy successfully. And you have a number of examples of countries who have maybe not as rich as Qatar, but are reasonably wealthy, and still are able to create a technology economies. And you have very good examples of countries that, in fact, were probably quite poor, but have used technology to become wealthy. So, if you look at the success stories, the success stories which are striking are countries which have used technology to leapfrog and to improve the quality of life for citizens and improve the knowledge economy in their own uh, boundaries uh, effectively. And for that, you require all the things I spoke about, the leadership and all the other things that I mentioned. So I think it certainly makes it easier, but it doesn't solve any problems. And I think, you know, you only have to look at the GCC. There's a lot of wealth in the GCC. But not all countries are doing equally well. I, I would just uh, basically repeat what uh, Dr. Savitra said. Um, I think the, the thing that struck me when I first came to Qatar was the, the key thing that is actually in place. And that is the recognition of the impact that technology can have. I use the same words to improve the quality of life of citizens, to accelerate business competitiveness, and to improve the effectiveness of government. That is key thing that must be there in place, that recognition. And second, what are your strategies and action plans to achieve uh, a difference? And over a relatively short period of time, Qatar has actually uh, achieved that vision and has started to translate that in, from strategy and policy to action. Okay. On the same report, what struck me is that uh, the comparison is made with the EU, uh, the EU and the uh, OECD countries rather than the GCC or the US. Uh, was that a deliberate choice from one of the party party to show that the question of the first one is the right way to do it? Or whether we're not the very good no, my question was in, in the report, the Qatar ISIS Scale report. What we did is uh, we compared Qatar to the OECD and the EU countries, basically. Instead of looking into the region, uh, the GCC or the Middle East. My question was, was that a deliberate choice from uh, ISIS and Qatar? And also, for Dr. Sumatra, is it the right decision to, to go that way? The fact that we were looking for collecting and comparing data, uh, Qatar against the various countries, we looked at various the data that were available, those were available for the countries like America, for European Union, for Singapore, and then the indicators that we had, we tried comparing them. We found that most of the data was available for European Union. We tried to compare uh, Qatar. It's not a question of availability of data. Yes, it was uh, availability of data, and to, to uh, benchmark ourselves against some of the developed nations. So, so that we can keep looking ahead and also compare ourselves with the countries within the Middle East. Within the Middle East, we found that a lot, a lot of data was available from UAE, some of the countries, 
that are still right behind us. They still have released information on various indicators. So we hope we have data from other, from about more countries in 2010, and that analysis will be very, very strong. Dr. Well, you know, what are my, my own recommendation would be is that you have to compare yourself with the best and the most relevant benchmark, uh, which may not necessarily be your neighbor or next to you. So in the case of the metric which I see compared to the core, which is very much around penetration and you know, very sort of classical technology metrics, my guess is that uh, the OECD countries are a very good benchmark to choose for that. Uh, if you're trying to benchmark on use of ICT for the oil and gas sector, I'm just taking an example, you might want to benchmark against some GCC neighbors, uh, or maybe a specific OECD country like Norway or something. But uh, I think you have to choose the right benchmark, and the right benchmark may not necessarily always be your neighbor. Yes, um, this is Anthony Kowale. I'm from Asikabata. I have a I'm not sure microphone is working. Hello? Yeah, it's okay. Hello? Uh, I'm wondering if uh, your experience, what, what do you think is the KPIs of the factors that makes a uh, country kind of continue uh, going in the right uh, you know, upwards? You know, if, if you ask me to simplify, because we have thought about this question for a long time in terms of what differentiates countries that do better than others. And part of our research has tried to focus on countries that move faster you know, than others. And the number one factor almost invariably comes down to leadership. And it might be a very simple and obvious fact to state, but somehow the top of the country has to realize the importance of IT. If the top of the country doesn't realize the importance of technology and the general input as well, not as just as a mobile penetration, because our people get often, I guess, misled by the consumer access technology, you know, whether you have mobile phone or whether you have internet access, which are the more consumer aspects. But technology has a very deep aspect in terms of improving efficiency, improving transparency, improving governance, and so on. And if the top of the country understands that, the rest happens normally. <coughs> so if the top of the country doesn't understand it, you don't necessarily get that kind of holistic movement. So number one critical factor would be the leadership, understanding that message. The number two would be an attempt to set the right environment. So the environment, a number of variables are there. And we have looked at countries which have similar levels of technology penetration, but perform differently. And the difference is not technology penetration. The critical difference almost always is the environmental factors. So why does France and Germany not perform as well as some Scandinavian countries? It's not because of technology. It's because of the environmental factors. So I think what you start seeing is number two is the environmental factors. And number three really is almost a prerequisite, but still I'm putting it number three, even though it might be one of the critical things, of the people, the soft infrastructure. So if you don't have the people's skills, if you don't have the ability, you cannot use technology effectively. Inside the European Union, and I work very closely with the EU, you know, people have realized that today in Europe, everyone more or less has access. It's not 100 percent, but more or less everyone has access. So the big debate is no longer access. The big debate right now is skills. So we just did a study for the European Union looking at the skills gap in Europe and looking at how to overcome the skills gap. Because the big challenge right now is how do you raise the skills and how do you reduce the skills gap such that people are able to use the technology in the right way. Yes, can I just add to that? Maybe just to help uh, answer the question. If you turn it right and say, what are the common uh, mistakes that countries actually make? Uh, one of the mistakes that I've seen other countries make is the, the sort of view that it, uh, build it and they won't come. Uh, assume that you provide the infrastructure and that can be PCs, can be broadband, 
and something will happen. So come back, coming back to Dr. Sumitra's point is do not assume that just because the infrastructure is there, everything will eventually happen. And that's when particularly raising awareness uh, comes into play and actually stimulating the market to start that, that, that coverage. Okay, question. Go ahead. Uh,
say oil and gas or the financial industry, where it is spread, spread out sample by the basis across. So it's all data uh, that we have, but since when we go ahead in executing the findings, it's more about having the number of employees within an organization. And that's the major reason why we limited ourselves in presenting the findings as per the, these groups. Okay, I have a question here. Okay, go ahead. Hello, I'm Tarek Khattab from Ryan Station. When I hear the microphone, it's not loud. Hello, I'm Tarek Khattab from Ryan Station. When I read your report, I discovered that you are uh, covering health education papers. But I didn't find anything about the law, the relation to the law. Where is it exactly? The relationship with? Law. Legal. Now, uh, linking the findings or presenting the regulations were not uh, ideally considered in the beginning. There's a part of secondary research that will be easily mapped against our findings. So that is the major reason why we do not, we have not reported it as a major uh, part of our report. That, that's a major reason why it's not.
for Qatar or for many countries to compete on costs. I mean, it's, 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 it's virtually impossible for you to compete on costs. So what you can compete on basically is the value of your ideas. So that's the reason why research and development is very important, is to be able to create an environment where people create ideas and people take ideas forward. Can I have that? Potato uh, Ludwig, Qatar University. Uh, the network readiness index, my understanding is that it measures the readiness, it measures the environment, it measures the usage, the penetration, measures these things. However, there is one extra level, there is one beyond that, there's the feedback, there's the impact that this, I believe that there is an implicit sign, assumption here that more usage means better quality of life, more usage means better wealth. So there's that missing missing part. So is there any other index that measures that part that incorporates you, you're, you're professors, you pick the you pick the weakness immediately also. Uh, let, let me give you the history a little bit of it. When we started we started the, 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 the model. The initial model was readiness and impact. And then we realized we don't have data for impact. Okay, it's very difficult to collect data on impact for 134 countries. So what we did essentially because to make a practical choice implementation was to say, okay, we will measure usage which was more easily measured. So you're absolutely right. The right variable should be impact. But today for 134 countries around the world, we don't have a way to do it. So it's just because of the lack of data that we, in fact, move to use it. But if you do it in a more focused context than Qatar, I would certainly recommend that in all the variables are more focused on impact as opposed to the usage itself. But we are right. Okay, the last question from the audience. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Chris Bergmark. I represent the vendor uh, community as country manager of Ericsson here in um, It was mentioned um, in the presentation that technology can be an accelerator for, for development of countries. I guess we can all rephrase that and say that it's actually a requirement to be requisite. So, couldn't agree more with, with the vision of ICT Qatar. However, obviously some limitations. I was mentioned in the presentation the need for not only putting putting the infrastructure and putting the things there, but also secure that thing. In that regard, I guess it's interesting to see that the number one perceived barrier, according to the report in business, is the lack of benefit. To me, that's a bit of a surprising statement, considering the enormous dependence we all have running the daily operations, the, the dependence on, on ICT and modern IT systems. Have you gotten any, any insights and understanding to that statement of how is it that business in Qatar doesn't see the benefit of ICT? Yep, uh, certainly answer that question. Um, in many countries this, this is the, the issue. Um, it is uh, very much a, a view of I don't like it because I haven't tried it. Um, and many countries that are going through that first part of the, the curve, uh, it is to do with conveying the right message. Even my own country, which is an oil producing country, or was an oil producing country, uh, we went through that phase of pushing technology. And this was a mistake. This is to do with achieving business benefit through the use of technology, reducing your costs, improving uh, access to markets, all of those things. So that's why last year we started this program, which actually explains the benefit of business. It is not a cost, it is actually it, the use of technology. It is not a cost, it can impact the profitability of your business. So we started that program late last year, and as I say, we're actually be ramping up by about a factor of five the number of companies that will actually be attending these courses. Um, but that's just one element, it's a whole series of elements to raise awareness, to actually get the usage up, get access to some more applications, 
simple applications down at the bottom end of the market or complex as you've got market. So there are a whole series of programs that hopefully next year we'll actually see that awareness uh, and impact actually achieved. I have to take another question. Please, please go ahead. Hello, this is, uh, my name is Dr. Ahmed Mohanadi. I'm a member of the I would like to thank you for your report. It's really uh, good and encouraging to move forward. I just like to go back uh, to the year uh, 2000 where the state Qatar started to establish the e-government and uh, it was the will of the His Highness the Emir who uh, initiated that project in the year 2000. I was lucky to be the, the e-government uh, you know, uh, uh, there with my committee and we started the, with a small project called the pilot project and uh, successfully uh, made a good story in the state of Qatar uh, about e-government and the transformation of the government. I think, uh, in my opinion now, looking back, you know, 10 years now almost, I, I really myself feel proud, you know, to, to be a member of the teams who participated in uh, making this achievement. And uh, I really see the state of Qatar uh, move uh, very well in this direction, especially ICT and the, the initiatives that have been uh, um, uh, stated. Uh, the state of Qatar is a small country, and uh, of course, uh, resources are very important to, to enable this uh, initiative. Um, I would, you know, think that if we continue in that pace, uh, we will uh, achieve our goal. Uh, but we need to move forward. We have a very good infrastructure. Uh, Qatar put the CA, the PKI, and the CA, the Certificate Authority, established almost in the year 2003 where not many countries had a CA. We have smart cars, we have the good infrastructure. But we need to continue sustaining uh, uh, doing, not thinking about more of technology. I think technology is here. But we need to sustain doing, implementing, uh, and moving forward. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Hassan uh, for, for her, her uh, uh, you know, effort. I would like to thank all the ICT members uh, and uh, everybody in the state of Qatar who participated in this project and uh, myself. I look forward to see many services to come to me at home. That's why I would like to access my government from my home, not from uh, the towers uh, around the West Bay here, but to be there in my home and I can access all the services of the government. And uh, initially when we started the e-government, we said e-services, e-information, e-knowledge. Unfortunately, up to now, our aim, what we are going to be aiming for is knowledge. Uh, but, you know, we are still moving in the services and information. I hope by 2015... Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, the last question is the closure, which is to ICT report. I mean, this is a what's next? I mean, the next is the administration with the stakeholders. So, how are you going to be with your stakeholders? When, when should we expect the next report? The next report, uh, well, we will be releasing the current one uh, shortly. It will be made available. It will be sent to the key stakeholders. Anybody who is interested in uh, accessing the report online can go on our website. There is a link which is mentioned on the report that is available here, the prototype. And uh, for the next one, we, yes, we will proceed. We are going to gather more of data. Is going to help us uh, do high level analysis. And I think next year we should see 2010 report at the same time. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say, as Alex said, we have a special section on our website about this report, both in Arabic and English. So I think even for the journalists, I mean, you can easily access it. It's available. Even the NCI report that uh, Dr. Samantha has been talking to, you can access it from our website. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate your attendance. And I want to thank the panelists for being here. Dr. Samantha, for coming over. And uh, some of you probably will see you tonight in the evening of, uh, when you're talking about this book. But there's a reception outside, so please join all of us. Thank you.